Today I'm releasing this video. I've been working on it for a little while and I am by no means an expert. This is for libertarian leaning folks who have uh, YouTube channels, Odyssey channels, podcasts, etc. Content creators in their promotion of liberty. That's who this video is for. So if you don't have a channel like that, if that's not your thing, then uh, this probably isn't of any use to you. For those of you that are still here, um, my my expertise is so limited. I've had my channel active for like, three or four years now. I have just a little over 500 subscribers, which is nothing in the scheme of things. Uh, if you look at YouTube uh, channels, uh, it's, it's very little. My philosophy is uh, something I learned from my wife, who was a nurse for years. And the idea is see one, do one, teach one. And so I've done some study, and uh, that is... That's seeing one. Uh, doing one is actually having a channel, promoting it, trying to do things right. And then to really complete this cycle of learning something well, there's the part of teaching. So I am teaching this, and please know I'm doing it with all humility. I've reached out to some folks who know a lot more than I do and run things by them. They've offered advice to be included in it. Um, so sit back, enjoy. I'm no expert. Once again, uh, hopefully this stuff makes sense. If you can get out of these 13 things, if you can get one or two, they really help take your, your content to the next level. I'm going to consider that a win. So uh, enjoy. Thanks for, thanks for watching. The first thing we'll talk about is uh, the, your sound quality. And you're going to hear this later uh, multiple times, but sound quality is more important than the, the visual quality. So making sure that you have a, a sound that is loud enough and crisp enough uh, is very important. Something that will help with this and uh, is kind of a, a similar thing is the echo in a room. Most rooms, unless there's a lot of something to block the sound waves, just like water waves uh, would be blocked by something in their path, same thing happens with sound waves. And so to get over this, the inexpensive quick way is to just get clothing or towels or sheets and kind of put them around the area where you're going to be recording. And that'll help absorb some of the sound. Uh, if you want to take the next step up, and I'll put some links uh, of what I have kind of done a little bit of research and figured out might be good ideas. Um, there are some professional sound absorbing material, some, some foam pads and some harder panels uh, that you could put up uh, that would also help, you know, even more so than just laying clothing around. But Laying clothing around is better than nothing. And part of this audio quality thing is learning a little bit about it. And I am struggling with that. There's equalization, there's normalization, there's gain, audio gain, which uh, there's denoising. It kind of depends on the app that you're using, your video editing uh, application or, or program. Um, it depends on what you're using, what it's called. Uh, but the more you can record properly and you don't have to fix it later, the better off you'll be. Also, think about what is in the background, uh, what is behind you in your video. If you have something that is, I don't know, that shows that you live poorly, that, that you're in a studio apartment or you're recording from your bedroom or your kitchen or something like that, unless it's something that most people would think is pretty neat, that isn't distracting, um, try to hide it. Try to find a professional place because what is in the background, you know, I've seen so many videos of people and they, they have, you can tell that they don't have any real furniture. They've got their TV sitting on an old crate and the wires are all exposed. It's okay not to have a lot of money. It's okay not to have nice, professionally decorated home. Obviously, that's okay. Let, let's do the best we can, but at least make it neat and, and clean and crisp. Maybe it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me that much, but some people will be really turned off by this. And if the goal is to get a lot of eyes on your video and to have people like and trust you and truly listen to what you're saying, have a good background. Um, part of this is the, the color scheme that you think about. There's something called a color wheel. And we each have a little bit different skin tone. Mine is, depending on how the light is, re is reflecting against me, generally it's a reddish tone. So the opposite of my skin is a kind of a tealish, bluish, greenish kind of color. Check on this color wheel, find, just 
look it up online, find a color wheel, look at the color that you appear to be on videos, and look at the opposite directly across the color wheel from that. That is the perfect thing to have in the background. And if you kind of pay attention on videos, like professional uh, movies, TV shows, etc., you'll notice that a lot of times when there's dialogue, there will be a painting in the back that is bluish green. There will be the sky. There will be something, a building with that hue, smoke with that hue, something like that. And the idea is to make our face pop off of the uh, the background so that it really emphasizes the, the subject in the, the video. So think about what you can put behind you. If you're doing, if you're recording on Zoom, which I frequently do, you can use the blur background function and you could just hang up random junk, like you borrow your sister's uh, blue dress, hang it back there, go find a blue tarp, hang it, find something else green, some, some old palm tree fronds uh, from a costume that you had, hang those and then put it on blur. And now that'll create that kind of neat bluish green background. I'm in my house right now by the fireplace. How does my color look? How does the background look? Is it disturbing? Now I'm gonna turn a little bit and there is one, there are one of our windows with the, you can see the firewood outside. What's wrong with this image? Notice as I move my head, you're skitting the bright and not. Let me go back this way. Up oh, there's another window, but I see some green there. You know, if I could get that green to contrast with my face, maybe by backing up here, ooh, maybe I could even close the window and then this could be a real, ooh, that background is looking better. Ooh, and that's a neat old uh, Humphrey lamp up there that uh, is propane powered. That's kind of neat. Would Maybe my audience would really love that. No, they wouldn't because nobody knows about those lamps. What if I came over here to this wood? I've got my red face in the background. I've got a red throw blanket over the couch and red wood in the background. Is that a good contrast kind of thing? And now I'm standing on my back porch and I just tapped, the, I'm recording this on my phone, I tapped my face so that that's what's on in focus. Now I tapped the background and look how my face turns out. Play around like I'm doing right now. See what these different backgrounds look like. Oh, hey, that's kind of cooler. We have our little reflection going, but it's still not just great. What would be good? Now it's too bright for me. I can't even see. Now I have to wear sunglasses. Does that make me likable? Think about these things. What about this background? What do, you, what do you think about this? Is this too cluttered? Hey, by the way, over my shoulder right here, that's some of Flynn Johnson's garlic. He died a couple years ago, but uh, his memory lives on. Next, let's talk about identifying your audience, your target audience. And hopefully you have a target audience in mind. Hopefully you're not making a video that will appeal, that you think will appeal to all 7 billion people in the world at least break it down by language. I'm, I'm appealing to English speakers or people who understand English. Furthermore, I am mainly appealing to people who are doing okay financially. And by this, I mean, if someone is, you know, if some gal in some country is planning to go out after watching a video in the morning and she's going to be walking with a, a, a buckets, uh, empty buckets to go 10 miles to get water out of a murky, river to bring back so that her family has something to drink and she'll probably get raped on the way there and the way back. She's not interested in my content. She's interested in survival. She wants to make do. Maybe she'd like a tip on how to carry buckets with squarer shoulders or something from a personal trainer or a self-defense tip or something like that. But she's not looking for philosophy. So really think about what is it that you are trying to say and who is it that would be interested in listening? The best way to do this is to develop personas. And these are, are brief little characters, uh, I, I, uh, personas. I, if you look it up, and actually I will put a link. I made a video specifically about this. Um, and, and, so, and so click on that link about personas and you'll learn more. So enough about that for now. Very important though. Think about what your channel is about. What is it that your podcast or your video odyssey, or if you're a little bit older fashioned, if you're still using YouTube, what is your channel about? A good way to come up with this is to do a story brand one-liner. And if you go to, I'll, I'll put the link down below, there's a video that Donald Miller did. I think he was on the Dave Ramsey show or something like that. 
but he did this nice 30 minute video that really explains well what a story brand one liner is. It's well worth watching that. This, this is kind of related to identifying your target demographic, but then the next thing is, what is it that you are gonna provide to people? Are you gonna provide humor? Are you gonna provide deep philosophical content? Um, are you gonna do some of each? Uh, Nathan Shucker, who is the, the head dude at uh, Pushroot Films, told me some time ago that there are, are various types of videos that you have some that are short teasers that people can just kind of come in quickly, see things. There are others that those are the foundation of your channel. Those are longer, more deeply thought out, et cetera. So he has a whole system for this. It might be worth reaching out to him if you would like some professional help on deciding what type of content your channel is going to have. Um, and, and then a the little part of this, just kind of a side thing, is a consistent look to it. I just recently hired uh, somebody, well, actually, I've been working with the person for years, but have uh, assigned my virtual assistant to do a bunch of thumbnails. And he's going along and he's going through all of my old videos and updating them with good thumbnails. And, you know, it's only 2 to $5 each, depending on who you get, and what kind of deal you strike. It's worth doing uh, because it's going to make you pop out from the other people who don't. And, and there's a huge break between professionalism, the people who do this professionally and who last for a long time, and the people who get excited about doing podcasting, spend $10,000 traveling to a city, going to some pod fest thing, learning all the tricks. They know way more than I do. And then they get back and they do five or 10 and it's not working out and they quit. There are a lot of channels out there like that. If you want to be in it for the long haul, and if you want your content to be a resource that maybe you're dead in five or 10 or 50 years, but your content is still being ingested by people, I go, wow, that person made a really good point. I've benefited from this. Well, think about that and, and make sure you're doing things professionally. And this kind of goes into number five, um, uh, being consistent in, in uploading videos or podcasts. And if you're not going to be consistent, let your audience know that. Uh, let them know that it's not a daily thing or a weekly thing or three times a day. If it's once a month and that's all you plan to do, that's okay. Just let people know. Uh, it, it's it's not the greatest thing to put out 10 videos in a week and then because you know, you're really excited and you're, you're producing them, you're getting them done, you want them out there, and then you do nothing for two weeks. Uh, kind of string them out a bit. And if you're not interested in doing them, you can schedule them on a lot of platforms. It will allow you to schedule when these are released. Or you could change it from draft status to uh, published status. And I'm not sure if that would hurt uh, viewership. I don't know if, if some of the channels kind of boost you in the beginning uh, or are more likely to suggest you to other, other people who are watching. I'm not sure how all those algorithms work. Um, but do be somewhat consistent. It's the best, best in the long run. Not something I'm good at, uh, but something that's a good idea. For anyone else out there who is a grammar policeman like I am, um, the, the, this is huge. This is so annoying when someone makes mistakes and they say, we seen the person over there instead of we saw the person over there. When you hear even one of these slip ups, it really communicates to the person who cares, probably 20, 30% of the population. However, I would suggest that those are educated people who are probably also intelligent. Those two things don't usually go together or don't always go together, but they're probably intelligent, educated, attention to detail kind of people. And those kind of people have a tendency to sometimes have a bit more influence in the world. They might be the business owner instead of the person who washes dishes for them. And so whether or not that's right or wrong or you like it, People who have more success, more financial success, more social success, have more influence. And if you want to reach those people, really be careful of what you say and how you say it. Uh, if somebody says, how are you doing? And you say, I'm doing good. No, you're doing well. Um, I, I, if you are not sure about something, I got a suggestion for you. There's another example. No, I don't got a suggestion for you. I have a suggestion for you. If you're not sure about these, play it safe. Find a substitute word that always works. Like if you're using got incorrectly, take it out of your vocabulary. You can always find another word to use uh, in, in place of that. 
in place of the word gut. Got it? <laughs> anyway, um, another one, and this is probably the biggest one. Libertarian-leaning people, engineers, rational attorneys, uh, scientists, have the ability to be a little bit less empathetic, a little bit less people personish with people. And frequently, we think of a person as a subset of, we think of them as a, as a scientific subset of the human race. There is one of those individuals that is a part of that larger group. Well, and, and so we think of that person and we think of them more as a, a unit than as a, as a wonderful individual. This comes through, and I am so guilty of this. I work so hard. Please call me out on it. You see my videos, and I refer to a person that makes mistakes. Point me at, call that out. A person who makes mistakes. If we're talking about an individual, if we're talking about a person, it is who or whose. This is a huge thing. Uh, we would never say a person that blah, blah, blah. We would say a person who blah, blah, blah. Uh, a person is is not the same as a company or a an organization. Really, watch some videos on this. Pay attention to this who versus whose. Now, the reason this is so important, and it's not just a little flubber like saying ain't instead of isn't, or, or even I don't know got versus have. It's it's much bigger than that because. For those of you who think there might be a little something to neuro linguistic programming (NLP), a person who uses a non-human term for a human is kind of showing some sociopathic tendencies. They're not seeing you as a person; they're seeing you as an object. Now, now sometimes that's okay if you're talking to scientists, if you're talking to medical doctors who are in a lab and they have subjects that demonstrated blah blah blah. That's kind of okay in the medical scientific world. But if you're trying to persuade people to buy a car or to investigate libertarian theory, if you're trying to sell something to someone, trying to persuade someone, know that 80, 90% of the population, while they might not realize it consciously, subconsciously, they know that you're thinking of them as a thing versus a human. So. Call me out. If I mess this up, oh my gosh, call me out. Put it in the comments on all my future videos. Uh, if you're a person that catches this, did you catch that? If you're a person who catches this, please point it out to me. We all need to do way better on this. Yeah, maybe not all of us, but most of us need to do way better. Let's think now about appropriateness. What is and isn't appropriate to put out there? Well, a lot of this depends on your goal. It's up to you to do whatever you want. Like this whole video, these are just suggestions or ideas. They're things for you to ponder and make your own decision. There was something that uh, the person who I look up to, Tony Robbins, there's something that he says that I think makes a lot of sense. A question you ask yourself, is this serving me well? If you would like to have a wider audience and you use foul language, you're not going to have as wide of an audience as you could have. Out of a thousand people, maybe 300, 400 will either be offended or will just prefer not to hear foul language. And so if you drop the F-bomb, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that the person who's watching will be like, yeah, I don't think I'll watch any more of this person's videos. That's what they're going to be thinking. And so you'll have fewer views. You'll have less success selling your ideas or whatever it is you're trying to persuade people of. You'll have less success. Now, if you are using it strategically and that you don't want this conservative Christian middle-aged audience, you want gangsters to, to watch your show and you want young, hip, cool gangsters. Well, if that's your target demographic, oh my gosh, cuss up a storm, do whatever you want, that's fine. Know though that in addition to what's aesthetically pleasing to your potential audience, Think also about algorithms. If you say certain words, especially platforms like YouTube, they are looking for people who are racist, homophobic, uh, like freedom or whatever. Like, don't make 
Like, don't say out loud some Thomas Jefferson quotes, like you'll be considered a domestic ter terrorist, possibly. Your video will be flagged. Your algorithm, the algorithms in YouTube will have less of your content put out there to people. They'll hide you from others. So really think about what it is that you get strikes for, what you don't. And I don't know all the details of this, but I know that I probably, somebody who's a, a popular singer who's still you know, people listen to their stuff. And, and I don't know, it's 2023 right now. So I think Pitbull is still a, a hot artist. I wouldn't want to have a Pitbull song playing in the background because they're copyright. I get it. Copyright ain't, ain't real. It ain't good. But in the society that YouTube exists in and we want to use YouTube, we don't want to have songs like that if we ever think we're going to be monetized. Now, that goes back to your goal again. You've got to have a lot of people following you and watching your videos before you get monetized. You have to have thousands of hours watched. I don't. I am so far from being monetized. I need another 5,000 or I don't know how many. But I, when I looked it up, it was just so ridiculous that I started laughing. Um, I, I grow my channel at the rate of about 100 people a year. And if there's anyone out there who's a YouTube tuber, you're rolling on the floor laughing right now at how pathetic I am. That's okay. Um, I would love to have more people who are interested in what it is I talk about, but I know that I'm kind of speaking to people who are, you know, fairly well read and who have an open mind and who have a good heart and who are interested in the philosophy uh, arena. They're interested in logic and reason and peace and 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 humanity. I, they're interested in the same things. And there aren't a ton of people who are interested in that at this point. So think about that for your channel. And, and as something I'm contemplating right now, the chances of me ever being at 5,000 subscribers is pretty slim. Well, if I'm never going to be monetized anyway, and I think a really neat Pitbull song playing in the background right now would be cool, yeah, why not do it? Um, evidently, the worst that can happen, if you get, only get busted a couple of few times, is the money from the video, the monetization money, goes to Pitbull instead of me. And I'm happy to help him out. He's, he's hooked me up with a lot of free music on YouTube. So if that happens, no big deal. Uno, no, three, I'm going to go back for a moment to, uh, I was talking about the background of your video, uh, what's in the background. This is my next topic. is isn't the background, but how you present yourself. Are you clean shaven? Do you have some scruff on your face? Do, is your hair, does it look like you've taken the time to comb your hair, or uh, do you have clothing on that's neat and pressed, or is it wrinkled? Are you wearing a ratty t-shirt, or are you wearing a, a button-up shirt? Do, who is your target demographic? It comes back to this once again. And back when I was a cop in uh, Hermosa Beach, California, I had a lieutenant, and he kind of became a mentor to me at the job and outside of the job. Complete statist. Um, loved him at the time, still appreciate his mentoring kind of pseudo fatherhood to me, uh, but absolutely a pro state, pro cop, pro military kind of guy. But his advice was always wear a suit. If you go into a party, wear a suit and tie. Whatever you're doing, wear a suit and tie. He says, if it's inappropriate because you're too well dressed, you're going to still stand out and people will know you're a professional. They'll know that you're, you're not just a low class bum who accidentally came there. Um, you can always make an excuse like, oh yeah, I'm doing other things and just came by here after work. Like if it's, if it's that awkward, you can make those excuses. Now, I no longer do that. I live in the rural Rocky Mountains on a little tiny ranch in the middle of nowhere. I don't wear a suit. I don't even dress up in a suit for the most part, 99% uh, of the time for a video. It's just, I, it's not who I am. And I choose instead to to wear what I usually wear. And that's typically a a button-up shirt, sometimes a t-shirt. You'll see me in car hearts and such. I guess if I wanted more viewers, I should probably wear a sports coat more often. Um, I, I kind of go for the cowboy hat look because that's what I frequently wear. I, it it kind of depends, but I guess my point is I'm not telling you what to or not to wear or how to look. Just know that if you're wearing a ratty t-shirt and you have a few days stubble, and you're slurping out of a, a Coke bottle and you're vaping, you're not going to be an appealing character to people who have a net worth over $100,000, are over 40 years old, 
um, who have read more than two books, et cetera. I have other exceptions to this, but in general, yeah, think about maybe having some respect for your audience. Uh, and I, I get that from the old, uh, uh, old bluegrass bands and they would, would just dress to the nines. And their thinking was, we're so fortunate to be able to make a living out here playing music for you good people. And, and like, we're just so fortunate. If we weren't doing this, we'd have to be out, you know, digging ditches and such. So by golly, yes, we're going to show you the respect of dressing professionally and neatly and wearing suits as we play our bluegrass music. And, and so I, I just kind of have picked up from that. And I, I think that's not the worst idea. I should probably up my game in this area some. It, it matters. And I would say Jeffrey Tucker uh, is a good example of this. When you see Jeffrey Tucker, uh, he's always in his bow tie. Like he's a professional looking guy, right? And, and Jordan Peterson, he's another one that you see those guys are always dressed really well. And you have a certain amount of respect, whether or not you should, whether or not that's an old Prussian style military uniform, whatever. It's in our world, people tend to give more respect to somebody who's wearing that. Number nine, technical help. Uh, get technical help when you can. Uh, and it's not always inexpensive. Well, it is always inexpensive if you go onto a, a video platform. If you go onto YouTube and you try to look up something like color correcting, uh, if you have a technical mind and you can understand things like that, you can probably watch a video or five videos and have a pretty good idea of how to color correct using Pinnacle Pro 22 or Premiere Pro or whatever uh, video editing platform you use. But seek out some advice. If it's not from videos or books, seek out people who are doing a good job at it or who really know their stuff. And for me, as I mentioned earlier, Nathan from Pushroot Films, uh, he was professional, like with what he does for a living. He knows his stuff when it comes to video production, content production, storytelling, lighting, audio, all of these things, because he started out small, just a small time person doing all the jobs. So I, I recall he did a commercial for our business once. And uh, by the way, when these guys are doing their work, they're getting paid a lot. I think we paid $2,500 for each 30 second commercial. That was the end result. And it took him days of work. But I recall him knowing he's looking where the sun was, had me sitting there and he was propping up these white uh, poster boards on the ground to reflect the sun onto me so that my face would be evenly lit. I think there are all these little tricks that these these pros know. So Nathan has given me a lot of advice over the years. Now, any of my videos that look lousy, not his fault. I don't always follow it. Uh, it'd be great to have a studio to put the time and effort and money into doing that. I haven't. I just kind of try to find a background that doesn't look too cluttered and I go for it. But think about some of these lighting things. And for example, in a little bit, we're going to, uh, you'll, you'll see some video of me with another person who I greatly respect, Kaysen from Anarchy Media. And he's been giving me a lot of advice as well. Notice how I look in the interview with him and look and notice how he looks. And he was in the middle of a job. And so he happened to be working where he was right by a stage and had all the gear set up. So we did the interview with him there. But as we started it, he went up and he looked at himself and he goes, oh, my face is blah, 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 too white or red or whatever. And so we went and made some color adjustments and came back. It was so easy for him to see that and notice it. I couldn't even tell the difference. But some people can really tell the difference. So my people were Nathan and Kaysen. Whoever it is that you have, reach out to them. Now, here's the challenge. Make sure you're not taking advantage. I'm sure either of them would be more than happy to say, yeah, here are a few things I've learned and give you five minutes of their time. But if 50 people reach out to them and want an hour each, that's becoming a full-time job. So really respect these folks' time. If you have the money, say, hey, can I hire you for an hour to teach me some stuff? And they might say, no, I've looked at your YouTube channel. You're putting out there what I want to donate to exactly. So no, I'll give you an hour. Or they might say, yeah, that, that sounds fair. And, and I don't expect you to pay me you know, $800 an hour or whatever I'm used to making. Uh, but make sure that you're taking care of the people who you get technical help from. They're real pros and they deserve, they deserve to be taken care of. Number 10. And this is on a scale of one to 10, this is a 10. Uh, this is important. SEO, search engine optimization. Make sure you learn a little bit about it. 
as you're building your channel, as you're building your following, as you're doing your thing, really make sure you incorporate search engine optimization. So many people do not. And I'm talking about people who know their tech stuff, they're gamers, they're, they're just brilliant technology people, but they haven't delved into that little subcategory of search engine optimization. Make sure you watch at least eight hours of search engine optimization instructional videos over the next six months. It is really going to pay off. Really, really worth it. Um, there, there are things like how you save your file name. Um, you, you save your video file or your audio file with certain words. Um, and you'll notice this. You can test it. If you save your YouTube file with a unique name, like 17413 Idaho 76, upload it to something, sit back, and then three months later, search for 17, blah, whatever I just said, Idaho 136. Search for that, and there's a good chance it'll pop up. Now, this is because the interwebs, as they go out and crawl, they don't really know what your video is about. They only know what you tell it. So make sure that you are telling it the proper thing, that this video is tips from an amateur on how to be better at, at content production. Um, and it's designed for libertarians. Make sure you, you find your keywords, your short tail, your long tail. Make sure you only do white hat SEO, not black hat. And, and these things I'm tossing out, it's about all I know, but learn those basics and make sure that you, you stick to them. And make sure that you're including tags, uh, whether you know, Odyssey allows five tags. Maybe if you have a larger following, they allow more. Uh, YouTube allows many, many, many. And so I have it set in, in YouTube that all the same ones pop up every single time. So I have things like Lysander Spooner, Libertarianism, Libertarian, Voluntarist, Humanitarianism, uh, Peace Advocacy. Uh, all of these things are automatically populated for every video that I upload. Then I go in and I say, okay, this one doesn't really have anything to do with Peace Advocacy. This is you know, how to change a rototiller engine or whatever. And then I'll, I'll change the tags for that. But Make sure you're including tags and make sure that you do something like uh, vidIQ, video IQ. Uh, I'll put a link for it. I, mean, I bet you they have an affiliate program. I could be making money off of you people, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I, it's it, for this. I'll do it any other way I can, but I'll put a, a link down there for vidIQ. And I use it and it kind of gives you ideas of what is and isn't good for your video. So, for example, you want to have the title of your video also verbatim in the description, and you want to have a tag with exactly that name. That's something that will boost you above the next person who doesn't know to do this. So it has a lot of things like that that it can kind of help you with. So that's really worth checking out. Be likable. This is huge. This is huge. Uh, there are many people in our consistent philosophy movement, voluntarism, humanitarianism, whatever we want to call it, there are many people who are not great at this. And so if you're watching this, really examine yourself and see if you are good at this. Don't be condescending. Be likable. And uh, this is one of the, I, this is probably one of the biggest thing that hinder, things that hinder the widespread dissemination of really good information. Those of us putting out the information aren't doing a good enough job of it being likable. Uh, and for some people, that's just really easy, at it, or at least they make it look easy. They just have this natural charisma and likability. And others among us have to work on it. We have to really think and study, just like any salesperson would study how to be good at sales, um, how to be liked, et cetera. Charisma on command or something like that is a, is a channel on um, one of the popular video networks. Like It's worth watching some of that what is it about Tony Robbins that he can walk into a room and command it, whereas Kip from Napoleon Dynamite is just a nothingness? What is, that, what is it that makes you likable? And if you can do that on video, geez, that's important. And I, I, I'm bringing this up, and I have to admit, this is, I think, the reason that my channel – is so tiny after so much work and so many years. Um, it, I, I think that I'm doing a lot of things okay. Video production quality isn't great. 
Um, but the message that I deliver, I think, is pretty darn good. However, I don't have that natural likability. But at least I can kind of defend myself after jumping on myself. Um, at least I'm not a jerk. At least I, I, I try not to be a jerk. And to, to illustrate being a jerk, um, I have a, a clip here that I, I got offline. Uh, Bill Burr is a libertarianish comedian, and evidently one of his followers got him to actually uh, check out Stefan Molyneux's uh, the, the human farming thing. I think it was True News Statism 13 or something like that. I've loved it for years. Now, the, a lot of the people I've tried to get to be interested in in Stefan's work, and back, I think back in 2007 or 8 was when I first started listening to him. I just hundreds, thousands of hours of his podcasts and such. And, and I always thought, yeah, the guy's a jerk, but his message is so good. It's worth it. I mean, who cares if he's egotistical and rude and a narcissist and all this? Um, he has a good message. Well, a number of people who I really like, who I passed a message on or the the links on to, they're like, this guy's a jerk. I'm not listening to him. And I, and I thought, well, gosh, you shouldn't do that. But, well, it turns out Bill Burr had exactly the same response. And this is what this is what he has to say about it. So I'll play a clip and and offer some commentary as we go along here. All right. Billy Beer Balls. Um, have you heard of the concept of human farming? It really makes a lot of sense. Forms of slavery, the population works and, pro and produces for the elite class. The quality of life is terrible because the ends to the means of working is really just to service a higher system. You have no idea you're a part of. This video summarizes it really well. Uh, sleep well. So I actually went to go look at this thing, this human farming. And I understand what they're saying. But they, as always, you know, they don't seem to. Well, I didn't watch the whole video, but it's like in the 13 minutes, are they really going to give me a solution? Now, I will admit that that is not fair of Bill Burr. Like... Um, if, well, one thing is he's demanding that he won't listen to ideas or explanations of problems or of things that other people might not realize unless they're accompanied by a solution. And I think it's perfectly acceptable to, you know, say, hey, I don't have a solution, but here's a problem. So, yeah, he's wrong there. And he's very wrong um, when he says, well, I didn't listen to it, but I'm going to give an opinion like, well, no, like. At least listen to it if you think you're going to give an opinion. Come on. Um, and it also, first of all, the guy narrating it might be the most arrogant cunt I've ever heard in my life. I can't even, I'll click on it right now if, if you want. You know, he's just like, you know, a lot of people might be confused. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Ah, Jesus Christ, I got to get through the Dodge Durango commercial here. 14 seconds. You know, he's basically going like, you know, some people get get confused and look at the government as it's this thing that's helping them out. But blah, 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 blah. Are you beginning to understand the cage that you were put in? Listen to this guy. This is the story of your enslavement, how it came to be, and how you can finally be free. Like all animals, human beings want to dominate and exploit the resources around them. All right, so that's the tone this guy takes. Let's get a little bit further into this thing. Here we go. Occupation throughout history, and it is now reaching its destructive climax. Human society cannot be rationally understood until it is seen for what it is. A series of farms where human farmers own human livestock. Some people get confused. Oh, oh shit, I, I pulled it away there. Some people get confused. Here we go. Listen to this shit. Listen to this. Talking down to you. Some people get confused because governments provide health care and water and education and roads. And thus imagine that there is some benevolence at work. Nothing could be further from the reality. All right, so then he breaks it down, and then in the end he goes, Are you beginning to understand? The cage that you were in. And keeps going. Some people get confused. It's like, dude, I'm not fucking confused. All right, you arrogant cunt. You sound like you're up your own ass. You sound like you're sitting on top of the fucking pyramid. Yeah, and obviously not be, uh, you know, just looking at the tone of the guy. But Bill Burr is not a, an engineer. He's not a scientist. He's not a logic-based person. He's an entertainer. He thinks like most people think. 90, 95% of the population think like he thinks. So here's this guy that's one of the most liberty-leaning comedians out there who has an open mind, who realizes the government is crap, and that he understands a bunch of crap out there, and yet he won't even pay attention to Stefan Molyneux because of Stefan's – I mean, everybody's known it forever. He has this narcissistic kind of personality, and he's egotistical, and he's a jerk, but he has some good information. And it's not being heard because he's such a jerk in his delivery. He's so condescending. He was one of my first 
introductions to voluntarism. I learned so much, but 95% of the population won't even listen to them. And Bill Burr is an example of that. All right. You know what this, this type of shit does that it doesn't take into consideration? It doesn't take into consideration mouth breathing fucking morons. That whole philosophy that why does this guy have this much and this guy has this much that it's always the rich guy is evil and manipulative and undeserving. I know this is shocking to hear from me the way I go off on bankers, but I'm really going off on the system of banking when I'm doing that. But like, you know, don't you guys have some fucking friends that, you know, they go to work, but they they have no direction. They have no plan and they just sit around bitch moaning, complaining about their fucking life, you know, and they feel like they did. They have like this sense of entitlement that they just fucking deserve shit because, well, why should this guy be rich? And I should. It's because maybe because he's smarter than you. Maybe he busted his fucking ass. Maybe you sit around smoking fucking weed or boozing it up all day. Like there's no personal responsibility. And so Bill goes on and on about this. But long story short, this could have been – Bill has a pretty good audience, hundreds of thousands of people. And he could have said, hey, I, I heard this thing on – or watched this thing on YouTube, and it was actually pretty interesting. And like I can't figure it out. I'm trying to think about it. But it, it sounds like it could be just – whoa, you guys should watch this. Wouldn't that have been neat? And instead he goes on this like, I don't know, 10 minute rant about what a, you know, bad dude Stefan is. And again, I am no Stefan lover any longer. Like, uh, and I've always recognized he's an egotistical jerk, but my whole point is what does it get you? If your goal is to get people to listen to your message, then don't be an egotistical jerk, or the word Bill used. Um, j- this is just so important. This is this is a huge problem in our community, and uh, yeah, I would encourage all of us to to be likable, be smart and strategic. This is a this is a big deal. Uh, let's not just sloppily do this. Let's be really smart and strategic. Think about your word choice. Think about neurolinguistic programming, as I've mentioned. Be strategic about the words that you choose. And what I mean by this is, uh, I'll illustrate it with an example. Let's say that broccoli suddenly becomes a public enemy. And the World Economic Forum and United Nations and United States government and YouTube and Facebook and all the big companies are opposed to broccoli. Don't use the word broccoli. Don't have images of broccoli. This will get you. This will get you put down. Now that this is just for algorithms for the video platforms. Beyond that, though, think about the proper words as far as what you want your people to understand. Is the thing that you are holding a sporting implement, or is it a deadly weapon? What word are you going to choose to describe that thing? And this is something years ago when I was. First becoming an instructor in, in the, the shooting arts, I, I remember being taught this, that, that we don't call it a weapon, we call it a gun, or we call it a pistol, but we don't call it a, a weapon. And that one little thing is so important, just subconsciously as it goes into people's minds, it is so important to really think through what words you want to use. Look into this neuro-linguistic program. You know, a great book for this is Modern Persuasion Strategies. It's, I think, 40 years old now, but and it's a sales-related book, but it is so worth reading. Absolutely must-read book. And it will make you really think about all of the little things that, that you need to think about that people are going to subconsciously pick up on. And make sure that you incorporate that into your channel. Be smart. An example of this is I use the word humanitarian now instead of the word anarcho-capitalist or voluntarist. In many cases, I use the word humanitarian or libertarian leaning or consistent libertarianism. And there's a reason for this. Why would I, if I'm trying to get an idea across and there are 20 names that I could give to this idea And I know that five of those ideas are going to turn off 80% of the people who are maybe going to watch or listen. 80% of these words, uh, or they're going to turn off 80% of these people right off the bat. Why in the world would I pick one of those words? Absolutely not. I'm going to pick a word that most people agree with, like humanitarianism. What is more humanitarian and more helpful to humanity 
than to stop the, the biggest robber of all time, like letting people know, hey, you're being stolen from. It's not really taxation. It's, it's theft. And be kind to others. Don't initiate violence. Be consistent. Let people know what to expect from you. Um, be productive. Be good. All these things that I'm teaching, what could be more humanitarian than that? Nothing, in my opinion. So why are we using the word anarchist versus humanitarian? We could use either one and get the same point across. How many people do we want to introduce to this idea? If we want to turn people off and have awesome shock value and be rough and tough and have all the little, well, all the people, our little tiny group of, of choir practice, yes, people who are, who are just I'm preaching to the choir here, have our little group. I say, oh, man, Shepard, you were so tough in that. You were like, anarchy rocks, man. Yeah, that was so cool. And then nobody else watches it except for our little group. Yeah, it's kind of a waste of time. Um, I, I really suggest that you think about how you can soften your message, make it more appealing, while not weakening your actual, the content of your message. Get the point across. Just don't be a jerk about it. Well, hi, Kason. I I'm wondering, what is your profession? Hi, Shepard. Uh, yeah, so as far as professionally, I used to be a TV producer for ABC television and NBC television, and now I do corporate events uh, all across North America. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks for being here to answer a few questions for me. You know, I've, I've over the years, you've helped me with some projects, and uh, you've mentioned a few things that I think you can probably elaborate on a little bit better than I could. So <laughs> maybe. Well, we'll I'll give it my best shot. Sure. Perfect. You know, I've heard you recommend that content creators not be a thief. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people, whenever they start talking about a message, they get all up in their head and they go, oh, this is about me. No, no, no. It's about the message. It's about what you're trying to put out into the world. Secondarily to that is the idea that in the attention economy, whenever you go on Facebook and you scroll through the feed, you're, you're like every second is like stealing a dollar from somebody. So don't be a thief. Try to get that message concise and quick. Okay, that makes sense. You mentioned something else. You mentioned uh, that the way that people make their purchasing decisions, whether they're purchasing an idea or an item or a product or, or something like this, that they, they make the, the purchasing decision one way and then justify it another. Will you tell me more about that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people get in front of the room and they say things like, hey, you should buy X thing, you should purchase Y service because it will solve feature and benefit. But I think people don't make decisions based on logic, though we'd like to believe that we are completely rational beings. Instead, people make decisions based on how they feel in the moment, and then they justify with the logic. So the logic does have to be there from a sales perspective or a marketing perspective, but you also have to create that experience, that emotional like, hmm, that felt good. I will continue to do that. That makes good sense. Thank you. I've heard of this saying that, and you've, you've mentioned it about some of my work in a very nice way, but I'm wondering what you mean by you can only polish a turd so much. Sure. You might call this the garbage in, garbage out principle in IT or in AV. We say don't polish a turd. So you want to give whatever you're working with the best chance at success so, for example, if I'm messing with audio, I know that this is about the distance that the microphone needs to be from my mouth. If I was going to polish a turd, it would look like this. I'd put the microphone very far away from my mouth, and then I would try to adjust it in editing to make it sound better. But here's the thing. If you start with garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So I think it's important for people in whatever they're doing to try to give their project the best chance at success by calculating, hmm, what am I going to suffer with later? How can I fix that now before we get into that place? Rather than, hmm, we, were, we are now in that place of suffering and despair. How can we dig ourselves out of here? That makes so much sense. And I think right now, I am definitely violating one of those. I, I have lights set up and a background set up in such a way that I don't have enough tech savvy to fix it. And I don't want to waste all of your time asking how, and I'm not going to understand the 38 different YouTube videos that I'm going to watch, or if I'm smart Odyssey videos, to try to figure out how to get the white away from my eyes and the, the red away from my cheeks. If I had somehow solved that in the beginning, then I wouldn't have to polish this turd. That 
That makes good sense. So a real quick idea for you would be to just tilt down the camera just a little bit, give yourself a little bit less what we call headroom, almost like we're trying to give you a haircut, but not quite. Okay, there you go. Cool. And then if you're shining your, it looks like a monitor is casting a blue glow on your face, you could dim that monitor um, mm -hmm. or color correct that monitor to output more of an orange-ish orange light. So like right now I'm being lit by one spotlight. This is actually, we're at a stage right now. I just had a couple minutes between to do this quick recording. Um, I'm actually lit by a spotlight that's putting out kind of an orangish light rather than a blue light, which is pretty unnatural to cameras because cameras, okay. they can they can guess what they think is white and red and green and blue, but we kind of have to tell it. And uh, we want to either have all of our lights be kind of orangish or kind of bluish, not really in between, not like a mixture. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for that advice. Uh, there's something else you've mentioned is uh, make short skirts, not pants. W what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I learned this in like an English class uh, in high school. It was around creating a, a paper, writing a paper. It's like it needs to be long enough to cover all the important parts of the topic, but short enough to remain interesting. I think a lot of people, whenever they're talking about something that's important, they go on and on and on about that topic rather than just hitting the key points and leaving space open, say, in a Q&A at an event or like, hey, catch me later or, hey, I'll do another talk about this in depth. So it's like, hey, let's do the overview and bust out all topics to this tune of, you know, 50 PowerPoint slides. Okay, that makes good sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and then you have also mentioned a, a tightrope analogy with burning building. Will you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so I heard this from a copywriter. I think his name is Nathan Frazier. Uh, it was the idea that if I were to go to you, Shepard, and say, hey, uh, we're here in New York City. Uh, I have a tightrope between this really tall building and that really tall building. We're 50 stories up. How much money do I need to pay you to get you to walk from building A to building B across that tightrope? No safety net, no training. Give me a number. Oh, uh, 10,000. Oh, okay. You're way cheap. Most people are like, <laughs> I will not do that under any circumstance. The risk is far too high. Right. Okay. But if I light that first building on fire, or if that first building that you're on is on fire, you don't need any money to try to walk that tightrope to get away because people are motivated by avoiding pain more than pursuing pleasure in general. Okay. That's a, that's a good lesson. That's a good lesson. And by the way, another great lesson that you gave me was sharing that uh, green screen video uh, uh, that, that, told all about how to do that properly and in the first place i'll link that down below thank you for that that was so helpful super useful yeah he's he's great at all of his content uh basic filmmaker on youtube okay so in our short talk here thank you by the way so much for making the time in the middle of your your work day to do this um what haven't i asked you that i should have that's a fabulous question i think a question for you let's let's delve in on this what is the biggest pain that who might be watching this might be suffering with like what is the pain that people are trying to avoid maybe i can help alleviate that you know i think the ability to get uh get a production value without putting in too much time money or having to understand too much and for me i'd be willing to put in a little bit more time and a little bit more money but I have a real challenge understanding even simplified tech aspects. So I think a, a turnkey, here are just a the 80-20, the Pareto's principle of here are a few things you can do to make your video way better with just very little effort. Okay, cool. I think this can all be done in the span of 30 minutes. So here's the 80-20, do 20% of this, or it's 20% of the effort, it'll generate 80% of the results. Let's focus on audio first. Because how do we communicate? We communicate with our voice and we communicate by listening to other people's voices in general. So we want to make sure that the audio sounds good. So the rule there is the microphone gets closer to the mouth. The closer, uh, the better until you are like eating the thing. Then it starts sounding a little bit silly. So if we can get that microphone within, let's say, one foot from wherever you're speaking from, you're going to sound clear. You're going to sound nice. And that's what we want whenever it comes to recordings, live broadcasts, uh, if you're creating a podcast, that sort of thing. So bring that microphone closer. And you don't have to buy like the $1,000 Neumann mics. You can go with a $60 uh, Samson Q2U is a, like a really basic, you know, it has a little USB cable, goes into your laptop, and it sounds really pretty good if you're doing relatively simple stuff. As far okay. as video, any kind of light on you is going to be better than no light. Because imagine if I take my cell phone camera and I go into a dark room, my photos are all going to be very dark. 
if I take my cell phone camera and go to a professionally lit TV studio, it's going to look pretty good. So lighting can make any camera shine, including like the webcam that's built into your laptop. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And by the way, when I've reached out to you several times for help uh, with this kind of thing or, or trying to figure out matrix or discord or whatever, just tech issues that an old man like me has an issue with. I'll use age as the excuse. And you've been so helpful and I've never paid you a penny. And I know that you and I both share this passion for uh, spreading the word about humanitarianism, about uh, voluntarism, peace, et cetera. And, and so you've donated some time to help me. And to a certain extent, I appreciate that. And I gratefully accept. And then at a certain point, it's too much. Thank you. Thank you. So if someone's watching right now and they say, hey, I really need to up my game um, and I would like to contact Kaysen, I'm curious, what are your recommended fees and um, availability and how would somebody contact you, et cetera? Sure. So it depends on the specific need. So if somebody is just trying to start a podcast up, they can just shoot me an email, Kaysen at anarchy.media would be the right place for that for content creation. If somebody's trying to put on like a multi-day corporate event, multiple rooms, ranging from like live TV broadcasts to large sporting productions, that would be Kaysen at prod44.com. Those are two different businesses. We have the same end product, but we have two very different audiences. For Anarchy Media, it's for those that are trying to output messages around humanitarianism or voluntarism, that sort of thing that we're a lot more flexible because we have a mission of spreading freedom through business rather than trying to just make it this, uh, what do you call it? Self-abasing, like, oh, I must suffer to, to spread freedom. To other right. People. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then while Prod44 is more focused on, okay, I have an event, I have a successful business. I need to output that in a manner that let's just say is a bit cheaper than like the hotel uh, and that sort of thing. So that's how we, that's, those are the two calls to action, I guess. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kaysen. Uh, I look forward to chatting with you again quite soonly. Well, yeehaw, soonly it shall be, Shepard. <laughs> Number 13, and this is, should probably be way higher. This is something that uh, Nathan has pounded into my head. Write a script. You see, you don't have to hold it up in front of you the whole time and, and read from it. You can just you know, ad lib, but at least write it out once, read it once, before you actually get going. If you don't do that, then it's going to sound like you're just rambling and people aren't going to pay attention as much. Uh, it's just not a good idea. And I'm not going to mention his name, but one of my favorite content producers has a habit of making a 20 or 30 minute, video, let's say a 20 minute video, and he'll introduce the topic and make the point beautifully in the first three to eight minutes and then spend the whole rest of the video saying the same thing in different ways over and over and over. And had he taken the time to write a script and maybe even paused every so often and then cut back to the, to the video to make sure that he was covering everything and comes back, adds the things he needs to, if he had done that, then would he be getting twice as many views? Would my attention last longer? It's tough for me to say to somebody, hey, can I have 20 minutes of your time? There's something I really want you to watch versus, hey, there's this guy that just put this video out and he did this eight minute short little video. Would you do me a favor and watch it? Like it's so much easier to ask somebody to watch something that's short than something that's long. So make sure whether your video is short or long that it's packed with content, it's packed with value. And, and you heard Kaysen talking about this. This is the, the whole thief idea. Make sure you're providing value in each of your videos, whether they're long or short. And I want to say again, I'm not an expert in any of these things. I'm just going by the whole see one, do one, teach one kind of philosophy. Um, I'm not an expert. Don't look at my videos and, and copy them unless there's something you like from them. Look at the people who are getting a lot of views, who are sharing a similar message, um, if you think that they are doing as good of a job as they can. Because some of the top producers of libertarian content uh, could have 5, 10, 20 times bigger audience if they changed a few things in their tone and delivery, their audio quality, et cetera. So make sure you're choosing the right role models. But maybe, maybe going to something where you, you're looking at the top YouTube channels. Why does this YouTube channel have 15 million subscribers? What about it is so neat? 
Um, why does, and sometimes it's just that the, the person is so engaging or intelligent. And that's one of my challenges is I don't have that natural charisma that those of you watching this right now are thinking, man, what a cool guy. I'd love to barbecue with him. And, and why don't I just share this video with all my friends? Cause even if they don't like the content, man, it's fun hanging out online with Shepard. Well, I wish that was me, but it ain't me. If you are that person, awesome. Great. If you're not, then maybe keep your messages a little bit shorter because that's not what people are looking for. They're not looking to hang out with you. They're just looking for that little bit of value that you can give them. And in this case, you're not going to expect to have a huge followership. You're not going to have as much reach. So why are we doing this anyway? I guess I guess some of us just think, I have some things that I've thought about that I think are, are pretty important, pretty neat, and I'd like to share them. And whether two people listen, watch, or two million or two billion, I, I've got to put it out there. I've got to say my piece. That's why I do it. As you might recall from the introduction, my hope, my goal was that you would get one or two, maybe three things out of this video that will help you make your content better. If, uh, if that's the case, if this was helpful to you at all, please give a thumbs up, please subscribe, uh, please let me know how I can help support you more, and uh, let's go out there and spread some freedom.